Sometimes it would be better to go when it would be easier to stay. So, now, the premise of this whole series is based off of these decisions that we make in everyday life. Every single one of us have decisions to make. Some of you are thinking about some of those decisions right now. Like, when is this going to be over so I can uh, decide where I'm going to go to eat after service? Some of you are deciding, um, what am I going to do later tonight? Am I, am I going to um, watch the basketball game or am I going to go fishing with my friend? All of us, when we wake up, you've already made probably uh, 30 or 40 decisions this morning that affect you. And I want to congratulate you, by the way, because you made one of the best decisions you could make, which is to be here this morning. Amen? Amen. And sometimes even when you don't feel it, the best decision is to go when you know it would be easier to stay. And so I'm going to share with you some personal stories. And later on in the message, we're going to hear from one of my newest friends, Mr. Bob Sunday. And he's going to share some of the testimonies that God has, has done in and through his life because of decisions along the way to go when it would be easier to stay. But I just want to talk to you just for a minute before we move on about these decisions. You know, I think we, we overlook decisions in our life. And if you guys remember, and I know you do, because you listen to every word I say, and you write it down, and you put it in your memory banks, and you don't forget it. But if you can remember earlier in the year when we talked about um, habits that we go through and breaking bad, and, and we can get into these habits, and we can get into these routines of doing life a certain way, where all of a sudden decisions, everyday decisions, we go on autopilot, and we're making decisions just because we've made them, Yesterday, we make them today, and we don't even think about the decisions we're making. And after a while of years of doing this, we get into these routines, and we get into these habits, and, and, and we get into this place sometimes where we're bored with our life. It becomes mundane. It becomes routine. It becomes like, where is the joie de vivre? Huh? Where is you know, the excitement in our life? And I believe firmly that's because somewhere along the way, Somewhere along the way of our story, we lose sight of what God wants to do in and through us, and we lose the sensitivity to that still, small voice of the Spirit that would say, I want you to go, when it would be easier to stay. And we just tune out that voice, and we go along our routine, our daily routine. We stay in the same job. We stay in, in, in the same uh, routine of how, how we do life. We get up and, and we spend our 15 minutes, you know, reading our Bible and then maybe five minutes of prayer or maybe for you it's an hour of prayer and, and maybe then you go off to work and you pick up your same cup of coffee at the same place and you see the same clerk every morning and then you go to work and you say the same people and day after day after day, all of a sudden it becomes, this is my life. Isn't there something more? Isn't there something greater? It, uh, there's stuff in my heart that God has deposited there. There's dreams that I have. There's desires that I have. And some of you, you're, you're a little bit older in life, and you're even giving up on some of those dreams. You've given up on some of those desires because you, you've maybe made an effort at some point to see those dreams and desires that God's placed in your heart fulfilled, and nothing seemed to happen. Nothing seemed to work. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in this place where you just kind of like said, okay, well, I guess this is my life, and I just got to be you know, content with that. And so here I am, and I'm, I'm just going to do what I've been doing. And I, I believe that God wants to speak to you this morning. He wants to do something fresh. He wants to do something new. And he wants to challenge you to get out of the place that you are and that get out of your comfort zone, get out of the place of complacency and apathy, and to move you to a place that you couldn't get to on your own, that only he can take you there. And so we're going to look at some amazing examples in Scripture this morning of people just like you and me. How many of you know in the, in the Bible, when we read the Bible, you know, sometimes I think we read the Bible. Have you ever read it and been discouraged? Like you read the amazing stories that are in the Bible and you're like, wow, that's really awesome. Good for them. These guys, these people are amazing. That, that's great for them. That could never happen to me. That would never happen in my life. How many, you know what? When we read the Bible, it's like watching Sports Center highlights. Seriously. Now I'm a sports fan. I love, sometimes I'll just turn on SportsCenter, you know, and I love watching the highlights. Don't we all love, we love the, watching the amazing catch. We love, love watching the amazing touchdown run, the amazing goal. 
But we're watching the highlight reel of people's walk with God. What you don't see is day in, day out, them believing God in the face of adversity, in the face of their circumstances, not understanding where God is or what he's doing in their life, and still hanging on to the promises of God, hanging on to belief that he has got something greater for them, even though they don't see it. And we're going to take a look at one of the greatest examples in Scripture of that in the life of Abraham and Sarah. If you have your Bibles with me, why don't you turn to Genesis chapter 12. While you're turning there, I'm going to share with you kind of our main scripture theme for this message series. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says this. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Where? You guys are with me this morning? Are you alive? Come on. This is an interactive. I don't just pre- I like, I like some, you know, feedback here. Say amen, that's good. We like that in our church, so feel free. Just don't shout out too loud, okay? You might scare me. Let us fix our eyes on who? Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. So many times in my life, my eyes are not fixed on Jesus. My eyes are fixed on me, what I've got going on. My eyes are fixed on my bills. My eyes are fixed on the frustrations with my job. Yeah, believe it or not, as pastors, there are frustrations. There are. My frustrations at home with my kids, my kids are not perfect. I'll just give you that right now. Some of you know that, but I'll tell you that. I'm not perfect either. I know that probably comes as a real shock to you, but it's true. Ask my wife. She'll tell you all about it. My relationship with my wife is not perfect. When I start fixing my eyes on all those things, it can feel so overwhelming can it? When we start fixing our eyes on everything that we got to do, maybe some of you, you're already starting to think about what you have to do when you hit the pavement Monday, all the things on your to-do list, all the things that you're behind on, all the things you have to get done in your yard, all the, all the bills you have to get caught up on, all these things that are in front of you, and it can feel so overwhelming at times. The problem is our eyes are fixed in the wrong place. Our eyes are fixed on us on what we can and can't do, our own ability, our own strength, our own uh, creativity, our own ingenuity, all the things that we can do, all the things that we think other people can do for us. Listen, if we're fixing our hope on other people and ourselves, we're going to be disappointed every single time. Every time. Because it's a crapshoot, right? Sometimes maybe somebody will come through for you. A lot of times they won't. When you get up on Monday morning, maybe you toss the dice. Maybe the day goes good for you. A lot of times it doesn't. Maybe you'll get a check in the mail, like we heard about from Steve, that awesome testimony of getting a check in the mail for over $6,000, something crazy like that. But you know what? Maybe you won't. What happens when you don't? It seems like when we don't see God, then we cry out for him. Then we want more of him. But but during regular day, Man, we're just fixing our eyes on ourselves. God wants to teach us day in, day out, no matter through the highs and through the lows, where are we fixing our focus? Where, where is our attention? What are you looking at? Because I'm telling you, nine times out of ten, when we look to ourselves, and we do, that's just part of the habits of being human. We're going to fail ourselves. We're going to be frustrated. And we need God to move in our lives. We fix our eyes on Jesus, who is what? He's the author, and he's the finisher of our faith. He's the one that started your story. Any of you sitting here today, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, what you started in faith is going to finish. It's got to finish in faith. What makes us think that what we start walking this walk of faith, that all of a sudden now we could put it on cruise control and we don't need faith anymore? We're just, we're just uh, clocking time in until we get to heaven. Is that our approach? But I think it is so many times in Christendom that, yeah, we're saved. We're going to heaven. Now we can just hang out and live our lives the way we want and have a good time and just wait until we pass on to glory and we get to that, that heavenly place, man. No, you have to know that God saved you for more than going to heaven. He saved you because he wants your life to become this beautiful story and this beautiful picture that other people look at and they're drawn to the glory of God because they see it in in your life. He wants to use you in an amazing way to reach people with the hope that you have in him. 
But I think so many times, and even in my own life, when I see I got stuck with God, it's because I lose sight of the vision and the call and the purpose for which I am alive. And this morning, God wants to remind every single one of us of that purpose, of that calling. He wants to birth something. And even for some of you, he wants to bring back dreams that have been pushed down and buried and shoved away. Even some people that trampled on your dreams and they spoke to you and said, that can never happen. You can't do that. You're not good enough for that. You don't have what it takes to do that. Let me give you a little bit of secret this morning. I agree. You don't have what it takes to do it. If your dream is big enough, there's only one person that can make it come true, and that's Jesus Christ, because he is bigger than us. He is the rock that is higher than I, and he's the one that will be able to take you to places you'll never be able to go in your own strength and your own capabilities. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus. He is the perfecter of our faith. Are you lacking faith this morning? then you need to come and fix your eyes on Jesus because he's the one that will perfect your faith in you. Let's talk about Abraham. The Bible calls Abraham the father of faith. What better example to look at when you want to talk about somebody that was willing to step out into unknown places to see the glory of God come on his life to do things that he could never dream of, things that were physically impossible in his life. And I'm telling you, physically impossible. Some of you this morning, you have physical impossibilities in your life. You're looking at things in front of you, and they are impossible. I've got good news for you. Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things. Let's say that again. All things. One more time. All things. How many things? All things. Genesis 12 one through four. And the Lord said to Abram, this is before he changed his name, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. Now, I, I've just broken off this, this verse right here because I think there's an important thing. When we start talking about going, what is God telling you? What is he speaking to you to go do something? The first thing that we have to know, and maybe if you're taking notes this morning, you might want to write this down. The first thing that you have to be willing to do is you have to be willing to leave. You can't go somewhere new without being willing to leave the place that you're at. And for some of you, I'm not talking necessarily about a physical place. I'm talking about it could be a physical place, but not necessarily. It could be a spiritual place. It could be right here in this valley. When we talk about going in the church sometimes, I know that there, there gets to be these illusions of going all over the way, and maybe God is speaking to you, and maybe he will speak to you this morning about going into the mission field, to going all over the world somewhere. But most of the time, in my experience, God is calling you to go somewhere spiritually that you haven't been before. In order to do that, you need to be willing to leave the place that you're at. You need to be able to leave the place that you're at. So for some of you, what does that look like? That leaving may, may mean that you, you have to be willing to leave the job that you're in. See God do something greater. Maybe you have to be willing to leave the physical place that you're in. Maybe you have to be willing to leave your financial position to see God move in your life in a greater way. Maybe you need to leave the comfort of your home in the evenings to go do something that God is calling you to do to change the story that he wants to write about your life. The key is this. In order to go to where God is calling you to go, you're going to have to leave. You're going to have to leave the place that you're in. You're going to have to leave what's familiar. You're going to have to be willing to leave what's comfortable because we get so, oh, man, I can tell you, man, we just get so caught up in routine. We really are creatures of habit, aren't we? We love our routines. We love the familiarity. We love the comfort. You know, we love comfort food. We love our nice, cushy pillows and beds and, and, and our, our way of life. That We just like it. It's comfortable. It feels good. I don't want to go do anything new. I don't want to break what, what, this place where I'm at. But in order to see God move powerfully in your life, to take you from where you are to where he wants you to be, you have to be willing to leave the comfort of where you are today to go 
do what he's called you to do. Amen? And he told them to go to the land that I will show you. Go to the land that I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt, and all the families of the earth will be blessed for you. Now, look at the pattern here. This is God's pattern. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And what, what's our role? You will be a blessing to others. What's God's role? I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. What's our role? All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So you see God's plan. I will do it. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. You will be a blessing to others. He is the one who makes us great. Now, in our society, we flip this around. We want to become great first, and then we want to be a blessing to other people. We're waiting for this enigma in time or this place that we find ourselves, where we finally come to a place where we feel good enough about ourselves and who we are and that we have enough ability, we have enough whatever gusto that we're looking for to get to bless other people. And God is saying, no, you've got it all backwards. It's not about you. It's not about what you have to give. It's everything about what I have to give. I am the one who will make you into a great nation. I am the one who will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. It's all about him. It's the great I am. He's the great I am because it's through him that you will be a blessing to other people. You ever try doing something for God on your own strength? I've done it too many times. I've done it too many times where I just thought, well, this is a really good idea. It would be really good to do this. This will bless people. And I've tried to do it. And you know what? There's like nothing there. It's like I'm trying to make something happen. I'm trying to force something to happen. And, and it comes off okay. But then there's been other times in my life where I've completely submitted to God. And I've realized I am in way over my head. There is no way I can do this without you working in and through me. And I just show up and say, I don't know what is going to happen. But when I do that, it blows my mind every single time because God works in and through me in ways that I could have never imagined. And it's not me. It's just me submitting myself to the power and the presence of God in my life and what he wants to do in and through us. Amen? Some of you need to realize this morning, you've been waiting so that you get to this place where you feel good enough about yourself, where you got your act enough together, where you feel like you can be used by God to bless other people. And this morning, I want to tell you, that's hogwash. In Luke chapter 17, hogwash, that's funny, isn't it? Yeah, that's just an old-fashioned, instead of like saying something I shouldn't, that's just a really good way to say it. In Luke chapter 17, there's a great example of this. There's the parable of the 10 lepers. And it's 10 people who have this disease. They have this disease. It's an internal disease that manifests on the outside and it looks ugly. Leprosy is always a type and shadow in the Bible of sin in our lives. It, sin starts on the inside. It starts with those little decisions, those little compromises that we all make. And it starts manifesting on the inside and it grows slowly over time until it starts manifesting on the outside. And when it starts manifesting on the outside of us, boy, it looks ugly, doesn't it? It deforms us. It changes who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to look like. And because of it, we are outcasts. In a, in a certain sense, or we think we are from God because we have this ugliness inside of us. And when Jesus died on the cross, you have to know something that's really important this morning. Sometimes I think we think when Jesus died and we accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, that our sins are forgiven, but that anything we do past that, beyond that point, is on ourself. It's on our own because he already forgave us of those sins, and now we're supposed to live completely perfect in front of him. But you need to know something this morning, that Jesus didn't just die for your sins when you got saved. He died for every single sin he knew that you would do the rest of your life. The price has already been paid. He's paid your debt free and clear from the time now to the time that you are dead. And that is good news this morning. 
All we have to do is recognize when we fall short, we got to come before him and say, God, I messed up. I need, to, I need a change. Why did this happen in my life? I come before you and I say, God, I am sorry. I want you to change me. And, and I turn from that thing that I did, and now I turn back to you. And I want to understand why I did that, because I know you want to grow me through me failing. Amen? Amen. God wants to use you in an amazing way, but he has to have a vessel that he's willing to go through. These 10 lepers, they all had leprosy. They had this incurable disease, just like you and I had this incurable disease called sin in our life. And he, they have this amazing encounter with Jesus. And when they have this encounter with Jesus, their expectation is, they, just like the rest of them, that Jesus would touch them, and all of a sudden they'd be miraculously healed. And something beautiful happens. I love Jesus. You know why? Because he doesn't do things the same all the time. We want to put him in a box. We want to say, this is the way he works. This is the way he does things. And you know what I found out in my walk with God? We can never, he will not allow us to put him in a box. Because he is ever-changing, ever-moving, and there is no formula to figure out God. He wants a real relationship with you where we're listening to the voice of his spirit, and we're walking with him in that relationship. There may be something he tells you today, and he tells you to do it differently tomorrow. And we need to be in tune with him and what he's saying to us. These ten lepers, he says, go and show yourselves to the priests. He doesn't say you're here. He says, go and show yourselves to the priests. And you know what the Bible says? It says something very interesting that I think is really pertinent to you and me today. It says, as they went, they were healed. They were healed as they went. They weren't healed right away. And I think so many of us were waiting for God to touch us or to do something immediately in our lives. Or we're waiting for that time where we're completely good. We think we're good enough. We're clean enough. We're, we're healthy enough. We're mature believers enough where we can be used by God and we can actually go and make a difference for him. And God is saying, no, that's not how it works in my economy. How it works in my economy is I send you, you go, and then you, as you go, you are healed. There's something about going, going, that as we go, God does something amazing in our lives. It's that process of going and stepping one step at a time in faith, in line and in tune with him, that as we step out in faith, he heals us just a little bit more. And as we step out again, he heals us a little bit more. And as we walk with him day in, day out, eventually we come to this place and we look and we say, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't have it anymore. I, where did it go? It's not here anymore. I'm changed. But sometimes we focus so much on wanting to be changed first, wanting to be healed first, wanting to be whole first. And God's saying, no, go. And as you go, you will be healed along the way. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he left her. Listen to me this morning. There's some of you, maybe you're here this morning, maybe you're 75 years old. Maybe you're 65. Maybe you're 55. And you're saying, what can God do with the rest of my life? My story's already been written. I'm kind of like on the last couple of chapters here. I'm, I'm just hoping to make it to the end. I want to tell you that God is not finished with you yet. I was just over in the Czech Republic with some amazing people called Don and Ruth Slaybaugh, and they're, I don't even know how old they're. They're like 85 years old. They passed Abram here. They're over 75, and God is using them in an amazing way. Why? Because they were willing to go when it would be easier to sit here in the valley in their rocking chair on their porch and be retired from their teaching job and just kick back and relax and say, Jesus, I'm on my way. I'm coming home. Anytime now, Lord, just take me. No, they're willing to go when it would be easier to stay. And because of it, lives are being changed. On the other side of the world, I got to see six young people give their lives to Jesus that had no grid, no clue whatsoever of, of, of is there a God? Before they met Don and Ruth, they didn't even know. They didn't even think there was a God. And now they've accepted Jesus Christ in their heart. And there is a real relationship birth. That doesn't mean things are going to be easy. They're having some questions about this new faith. But that's okay. God's got them. He's the author. He's the perfecter of their faith. 
Abraham departed as the Lord instructed. How many of you, God has called you to depart from the place that you are, but you've been reluctant to obey him? You've been reluctant to obey him. I've had to make some really hard decisions in my life, and I haven't gotten all of them right. In fact, I've probably gotten a lot more than I've gotten right. But I will say this, and this is for the glory of God, not for myself. I've made some really hard but good decisions. Some of the biggest decisions of my life I've completely surrendered to God when it would have been a lot easier for me to go the way that I had already planned. When I was in college, my wife and I, we were our seniors. We got married our junior year at Lee University. Wonderful college. Love my alma mater. We were there. We were married. We were barely making it. We were paying our own way, paying my own way. I was working. Both of us were working um, at a restaurant in Chattanooga, Tennessee, as waiters, waitresses. I was a manager at the restaurant, too. Sometimes I wouldn't get out of there till 2 in the morning. I'd get home, drag myself to class, and I still managed somehow to get on the honor roll. God just blessed me. When, when I was a dropout, man, I, I, I tried college after high school and before I knew God, and I completely failed. I mean, utterly failed. Like, I'm talking seriously F in every single class to the point where my dad looked at me like, what in the world are you doing? Like, do you even have a brain, you know? I'm like, I'm like, I cared more about the party than I did about the class. I was just there to meet with friends. And so we are working our tails off at night, you know, trying to just make a living. And we're in this college town called Cleveland, Tennessee. It is the, the headquarters for Church of God. That's a denomination. Some of you may be familiar with it, Pentecostal denomination. Some of you may not. And there was literally a church on every single corner of that town. I've never seen more churches in, in a small town like that in my whole life, okay? We went to probably 80% of those churches to try to find the place that God was calling us to. We tried this church, we tried that church, and, you know, they were all pretty good, but there was just something inside of us that was hungry for more of God. I can't even describe it to you. All I know is that, like, we, we weren't, satisfied with, with what we saw. There was a hunger. There was a desire there that wasn't being fulfilled. We went to this conference down in Georgia. It's like a three-day conference. We went to this conference with my in-laws. And while we were at this conference, man, God just spoke to us in such a powerful way. And, and there was this little church in Atlanta, Georgia, that was meeting in a storefront in, was a perimeter? Yeah, somewhere around there. And, um, and there's probably 35 to 50 people in this church and it was the closest church to where we were living that was associated with this group of churches that we felt God was calling us to. Here's a little, here's a little bit of a problem. The church was two hours away. We had to make a really hard decision. Okay, God, I feel like you're telling me to go to this church, but two hours one way? Really? That's like not normal. Come on. Do you really want me to drive two hours one way? To go to a, a church when there's hundreds of churches within, you know, 15 minutes from me? And he says, yes, I do. And I said, okay, if that's really what you want me to do, I'll do it. And you know what we started doing? We'd get off work Saturday night, sometimes 11, 12 o'clock at night. We would drive two hours to Atlanta I remember a time we had this little Nissan Pulsar. Car was like, I don't know, it's probably from here to here, right? Little two-door coupe with a little hatchback. One time we got there and we were locked out. We had, we had some amazing friends, Rhonda and Tommy Nell, that had this great house there and they let us stay there. One time we got there and they were gone for the weekend and we were locked out. We had no place to stay. It's like one, two in the morning. So you know what we did? We drove to a Circuit City. You guys remember when there was actual Circuit City electronics store? Yeah. We parked in the back of a Circuit City and we put the seat down and we tried to get as what little sleep as we could back there. And we got up and we went to church the next day. And we went to church, I think, just about every single week that we could for almost a year. And we got to know Charles and Carol Kinney, these amazing people. We started a relationship with them. Charles and Carol became like spiritual mother and father to us. And we started really just growing in leaps and bounds in the Lord. God was moving in our life in a powerful way. And we started feeling like God wanted to do something different. Now, sometimes God will call you and ask you to make one decision that will lead you to a bigger decision. 
There's some of you here today, and God told you to do something, and you went and you took that step of faith and you did it, and then that thing didn't work out quite the way you thought it would. And I'm here to tell you this morning that that was not a mistake. That was not a mistake. Sometimes God needs to move you from one place to another to get you in position for that next step that he wants you to take, to get you to the real place that he wanted to get you. Does that make sense? Now, I could take a lot of time and share with you how God used this in my life so many times. But I could tell you also that that small, what, what may seem like a small decision to drive two hours one way to go to this church in Atlanta, if it wasn't for that decision, I would have never been in position to make the decision that God put before me when he told me to go to Montana. I was in a worship service one time, and, and, and I felt after we, we were graduating college, I had plans, man. I had my own story I was writing. I was going to go on and get my master's degree in psychology. I was going to become a Christian counselor. We were going to live in Atlanta. I love the big city. City's awesome. We were going to live in Atlanta, live the life, man. It was going to be awesome. My wife was a teacher. She was going to be a music teacher in elementary school. We had it all planned out. Our story, we were writing it. And God interrupted that story. And he said, I've got something more for you. I said, okay, God, what's that more? And I met... I met with our pastors, and uh, Charles and Carol, and we had lunch one day after church, and I said, can you just help us? You know, I'm really feeling like God wants to do something different, but I don't know what it is, and I don't even want to tell you, but can we just talk about it, and you guys pray for us? And he said, sure. Well, let us tell you what we're doing. God has called us to move out to Proctor, Montana, and they started showing us some pictures of little old Proctor, Montana, where there was this small little country church out there. Because God was speaking to them. And we left that meeting and we were looking at each other like, are you kidding me? Are you feeling what I'm feeling? And we're like, yeah, but I'm not telling anybody about this. <laughs> they are going to think we are off our rocker because this is nuts. And so I said, you know, here's the deal. Let's pray about this for two, three months. Let's take a, a day a week. I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask the Lord. Two, three months in, I was in a worship service, and I felt like God said, you're supposed to go. I called up Charles and Carol, and uh, we had breakfast together the next day. They said, great, we knew what you were supposed to do, but we didn't want to tell you. We wanted to let God tell you. <laughs> I had no clue why God was calling me to Montana. I had no clue. None. I didn't have a job lined up. I, I didn't know where I was going to live. I didn't know what we were going to do. I just knew God said go. And I knew that he was calling me. I just knew in his spirit. And you know what? There was something inside of me that was dying because I didn't want to go. That's the reality. If I'm going to be real with you, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to uproot my life and leave our family, leave our friends. All of our family was on the East Coast. All of my friends, my college friends, I was leaving everything. Packed up this U-Haul and drove out to Montana, listening to some country music on the way, and, and bought me a cowboy hat, and we said, man, I don't know what God's going to do, but yee-haw, we're going to Montana. <laughs> and here we are, 17 years later. I would have never imagined I'd be up here speaking to you guys this morning. Didn't have a clue what God was up to, but it was by faith when I couldn't see it, it reminds me of Abraham. Listen to in Hebrews 11:8, what God's account of what Abraham did when he asked him to leave. It was this account here. It was by what? By faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and to what? To go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. And this is the kicker. He went without knowing where he was going. He went without knowing where he was going. So many times we want to figure out the details, right? God, I'll go. Just give me the game plan. Just tell me how you're going to work this out and how you're going to work that out and give me this detail and that detail. And God says, no, that's not a life of faith. You know, the Bible says the only thing that pleases God is faith. 
He's not asking for you to come with your mojo and all your goods and the things and the talents and the money that you have and, and all your plans. All he's asking you to come is with yourself and to say, God, I don't know how you're going to work this out. I don't know how this is all going to shake out, but I am willing to take a step knowing that you'll catch me, that you're right there for me. I'm willing to take a step of faith. Now, I'm going to invite my friend Bob Sunday up to the stage, and uh, I'm going to ask him to share a little bit of his story with you as we close this morning, because I think you're really going to be encouraged. Can we give a hand for my friend Bob Sunday? Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. You get the white chair, because you're, you're, yeah, you're, you got more white hair than me, so. Okay. <laughs> there. Thank you, babe. So each week we've been doing a little interview, Hello? hearing people's stories, and uh, I know God has used some of those testimonies in some amazing ways in some of your lives. And um, I'm just getting to know my friend Bob here. I call him a friend. Yes. We, we got to spend some time together this past week, and Bob came up to me after service. God's so good. And he said, you know, I'd really like to share with you my story. And um, I already knew what I was speaking on this week about going. And when he shared with me his testimony about how God spoke to him about going somewhere that was completely unfamiliar to him, I was just like, yes, this is the story for this week. So, so Bob, would you um, just share with our friends today a little bit about your story and about how God told you to go when it would have been easier to stay? Yes, I'd, I'd love to do that. I, I, all through your sermon here, I was... Uh, saying, you, you wrote this about me, <laughs> uh, and it's so true. Uh, so much of our lives is spent in our comfort zone. And, and, you know, we may not have to go from here to California. We may just have to move from our comfort zone out of it yeah. to Amen. serve the Lord. That's right. Isn't that wonderful? Today I want to tell you a little story about uh, prison ministry. I, I was... Uh, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, riding motorcycles with the uh, 1% clubs. And uh, I was riding with the Sons of God. I was... Uh, and that's a motorcycle group, is motorcycle that right? Motorcycle club, yeah, okay. three-patch club. Just to clarify. MC club. And, and, uh, and we were supposed to ride with them. I felt the Lord was calling me to ride with them so that we could make ourselves available to them to talk about God. And... Uh, and so we did. We rode with them, and I, I joined the club, and I got patched out, and I'm, I'm ready to really start riding and praying with these guys, and, and I met a man named Sonny Barger. Uh, anybody recognize that name? Yeah, he, he's, he's the one that started the Hells Angels. Wow. He's the one that started in the 60s. He started the Hells Angels. I was on a motorcycle ride with them, and it was his birthday ride. Really? And he told us to ride with them. Wow. And uh, a little while later, uh, I had a, one of the great big uh, one percenter guys come up to me, and he says, why don't you sock me? I said, what? He said, well, why don't you sock me? Right in the face here. I, I said, I, says, I, I wouldn't even want to do that. Why would I want to do that? He says, well, you can. He says, uh, uh, we got orders from the high ups that we're supposed to leave you alone. He's got your back. You see, wow. wherever we go, God has our back. And, and that was really an uncomfortable place to be a lot of times. Mm -hmm. But um, I rode with them for quite a while, and, and, and yet no man asked me about God. And, and that's, that's what I was kind of called to do. You see, I, I was called to talk about God. And so I did. I, just, I, I ended up quitting the, the clubs, and, and I went uh, back home again and, and started uh, riding by myself again in town. I started riding by myself south of Yuma. I write all of the interstates, and I put a lot of miles on. I was riding out south of Yuma, and I uh, was saying, Lord, Lord. I said, well, what is it that you want me to do? And, and, you know, I was riding, and nothing happened. And pretty quick, I heard in the back of my head, and that still small voice said, I, I want you to go to prison. Oh, I said, what? I, I said, I've been spending my whole life trying to stay out of prison. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, in fact, I, I, I should have been there many times, but, uh, but I, I got out of it. I, I was a nasty guy. I took drugs and drank alcohol, and I was an alcoholic, and I climbed power poles, and I was lucky because I lived through it. Anyway, isn't that wonderful? 
It's a good thing. Anyway, I, I, I rode down the highway just a little bit longer, and I, and I heard it again. Uh, I, I want you to go to prison. So I pulled my Harley right over to the side of the road right there, and I said, Lord, Lord, why would you want me to go to prison? I don't understand. And, and I walked around the highway right there for quite a while, and, and nothing was said. And I looked across the interstate, and you know what was over there? A prison, yes. It was a beautiful prison. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know there was such thing. But. Oh, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? So I said, Lord, you're serious. And, and, and you know, I was afraid. I was afraid to step out of my comfort zone and, and, and get into a tight spot of, of a prison. So you know what I did? I went to town and got another biker friend of mine that loves the Lord. And his name is Tom. And we uh, rode out there together again. I went back to town. I went and got him, and we went back right, right back out there again. Doggone it if uh, we didn't stop right where I, the Lord told me. And, and I pulled over, and he says, what are you stopping for? I said, well, did he talk to you? <laughs> he, said, he said, what do you mean? I said, did he, did he talk to you? He said, no. He says, well, I said, the last time I was right here, the Lord asked me to go to prison. He says, you know what? He says, I've really been thinking about doing that myself, uh, starting a prison-type ministry. I said, really? <laughs> so, see how God puts us together. And, and, and it made me more comfortable to step out of my comfort zone. And so you know what we did? We went over to the corner of the yard there, and we prayed there for just a little while. And soon we got the courage to go out to the gate, and we knocked on that gate out there. The guard came out, and I says, uh, I says, uh, do you have a religious leader here or somebody that's over there, uh, 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 Christian um, authority in the prison? He says, yeah, we, we got a chaplain. He, sa he said, you got an appointment? I said, no. <laughs> he says, well, he said, I'll give him a call. He says, you guys take your bikes over there in case somebody needs to come in or out. And so we did. We put our bikes on the side, and we stood over there, and we were kind of grinning at each other, you know, and, and out comes this little short guy. <laughs> That's pretty short. Yeah, he was, he was a short guy. <laughs> and, 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 and he comes up beside us and he says, uh, I'm, I'm Chaplain Webster, and the Holy Spirit fell on all three of us. And I know you know what I'm talking about. I said, well, I think the Lord told us to come and talk to the prisoners about, about the Bible. He says, I know. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? It is. And, and, and Tom, he... Tom said, if, 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 if God, if you make it easy, he says, I'll go in there with him, you know? <laughs> isn't that, too, it's just wonderful, isn't it? Anyway, he made it so easy, and three, three day, I mean, three weeks later, we was in prison. Now, I want to tell you about one man. I'm sorry if I take a little longer than I should, but this is a very important story. This, this man uh, came from um, New York. Uh, he was a black man. He was a real troublemaker, and he was given a choice in 1963, four, 1964, he was given a choice to go to prison or to the Marine Corps. And of course, you know what was all happening, 65, 66 and stuff. It was uh, the Vietnam War, and uh, he, chose, he chose the Marine Corps. And, and when he chose the Marine Corps, he went to, to do the boot camp. And uh, he, he didn't like authority. But finally, the guy said, uh, that was in, in authority, he says, man, he says, if you will listen to me, and if you'll just do what you're supposed to do for a little while, he says, I'll teach you how to kill. Not only will I teach you how to kill, but you'll be able to kill many. And see, this is what that man had in his heart was death and evil. Well, they taught him how to kill. He ended up going to Vietnam. And he ended up being a tunnel rat. If anybody knows what that is, a tunnel rat is a guy that goes into the tunnels underneath the villages, their safe zone, and then taking out anybody that's uh, an enemy down there. Well, he was the first one in, and most every first one in got killed soon after they started. Well, he never made it. He never got killed. Hmm. He made it through the whole war. And they sent him home. He got done with the hitch. Doggone it if he didn't go back to New York. And he wore that silk jacket with the dragons on the sleeves. And 
and, and it said Vietnam conflict on the back. And he went into a bar in New York City and there was two big white guys came up to him and said, what are you wearing that, vet, uh, that uh, jacket for? He says, I just came home from the Vietnam War and I served proudly with this, for this country. He says, I'm gonna take that off of you. And he says, no, he says, no, you don't need to take it off of me because, because I'm just gonna drink this beer and then I'm gonna leave. So he got up and he drank the beer and he left. He went out the front door, they went out the back door. Well, they met at the alley, uh, half a block away, and they proceeded to take his Vietnam uh, coat, and he killed both of them. Uh, he didn't only kill them, but he made a real mess there. So they put him in prison just for a little while to try to figure out what they were gonna do with him. Hmm. Well, as soon as he got into prison, some people got into his safe zone and he killed that guy. So they took him out of that prison, gave him another 100 years. Uh, so it's about 110 years that he had to put in now. And he, they sent him to another prison. It went that way all across the United States. And now, by the time he hits Yuma, he's got 1,010 years. Wow. Uh, no, it's less than that because it's 35 years later now. It's 2004. Two, no, uh, uh, 2010. And uh, that's when I was knocking on the gate of the prison. And Doc, I'm sorry it's taken so long, but I hope you enjoy this, and I know that you will get, feel the Holy Spirit through it. Uh, it was uh, uh, that year that uh, he was going to commit suicide by getting shot by the guard. And, and he was gonna go, he, he planted uh, shanks around the yard in many places where the white people stood, where the Mexicans stood, where the southern Mexicans stood, where the black people stood, and where the guards kind of come out of the gate, and where the, uh, the guard in the tower was. And he's the one with the uh, AR-15. Anyway, he was gonna kill people until he got right around to the guards until they had to shoot him. Well, that afternoon, that afternoon uh, was Sunday afternoon, and it was our first night in prison. Hmm. Tom and I, we're, we're in prison now, and uh, I've never been in front of people before. You see, I couldn't be up here except for the power of the Lord. I could not be in front of you guys talking because I used to be a lineman for the power company, and <laughs> I, I didn't talk to him in front of anybody. Well, anyway, uh, let's get back to the story. <laughs> uh, this man uh, was walking out and doing his breakdown out in the run. And nobody else was out there. It's about four acres, the, the run is, and, and, and nobody else is around. And he's walking out there making his plans. He's never talked to anybody for four years. People were afraid of him. They walked way out around him, and nobody would talk to him. The guards wouldn't even talk to him. They wouldn't even give him an order. Well, anyway, he was out there making his plans, and this great big guy co covered with the... Uh, uh, same coveralls and same color, came up next to him. He says, cousins. He turns around and looks at me. He says, what do you want? He says, you can't do what you're planning on doing. And cousin laughed out loud. He said, what do you think I'm planning on doing? And he kept walking away. And, and then pretty quick, that guy caught up to him again. And, and, and he says, no, cousins. He says, you've got to go to the meeting tonight. And that's our Sunday church meeting inside the yard there. And that's my first uh, meeting in, in, in the prison. So um, he, he, he laughed out loud and he looked around and, and that person was gone. Now, you see, it was a spirit that was, uh, that was God's spirit or the Holy Spirit was telling him to go to church. And you see, he never knew church. Hmm. He never knew church at all. And doggone it, if he, he, he started wondering what the heck is going on, he says, I better go to that meeting tonight. He didn't know what, that it was a church meeting either. So he went to the meeting, and he was the last guy in. And I saw him come in, and he sat by himself way over in the corner. Everybody else was all over here, but he was way over here in the corner. And uh, that night, I got up and told everybody why I'm coming to prison. Uh, let me tell you, this is really funny, but... Uh, and this is my first night in prison, and I'm sitting there with Tom, and Tom and I are high-fiving each other, saying, yes, we're going to make it, Tate, aren't we? We're in prison, and we're going to get to talk to these guys about God. 
And, and I looks up, and there's 10 people out there. I'm thinking, wow, this is really great. And then, and then I, uh, we're, we're talking and praying, and I look up again, and now there's 25 men out there. Hmm. Oh, and I'm thinking, Lord, Lord, what'd you get me into? <laughs> and yeah, I'm serious. Uh, I'm serious as a heart attack. Uh, and then I look up there, there's 85 men out there. And wow. 85 men out there. And these guys got white power. They got swastikas everywhere. And here I am, a little short, fat, black, <laughs> br brown guy. <laughs> I'm kind I'm of glad you now. clarified that. Yeah. that was, you know, yeah. You're be like Michael Jackson or something, you know. Yeah. 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 That's so. <laughs> anyway, anyway I, uh, and then I see that guy come in and the chaplain says, man, he says, I don't know how come he's in here. And, and uh, I got up and told him that, you know, I, uh, the, the Lord had given me so much love. Mm. And, and I said, Lord, what did you give, get me into here? And he says, Bobby, he says, I don't want you to, to tell him about the Bible. He says, I don't want you to tell him about religion. He says, I want you to tell him that the Bible is for them too. You see, I got awfully nervous. I was a pale face, probably as light as most of you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Anyway, I uh, lived through that, and, and then when God told me that, I told that to Tom, because he was another guy that had never been in front of people, and I said, God just wants us to tell him that the Bible is for them too, and he smiled right out there and said, wow, this is great, and I look up again, now there's 120 men out there, whew, and the, and the chaplain is up there, they do a, 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 some songs, and, and, and then the chaplain says, I want you to meet two new guys here that's going to come in and give you Bible studies, and and we'll try to work them into some of the sermons. And uh, doggone it, they said, Bobby, he said, I want you to come up here and read yourself. I says, you know, I've got so much love that God has given me that, that I want to share with you. And I want to tell you that I love each and every one of you guys right here now. And I do. I love each and every one of you right here because God loved me first. Mm. And he's given me so much love that I can't help but share it with everybody that I see now. Anyway, um, and so did Tom. Tom got up there and started sharing his love and, and told them that we, uh, we, we just came to tell you that we, we, we know that you know a lot about the Bible, but we just want you guys to take it inside yourself, to let, let you know that the Bible that's written and those words are for each and every one of us hmm. that's in here. Anyway. What that, happened to the guy with the... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? I know everybody wants to know what happened to the guy that was going to kill people. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to really get to that, too. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Anyway, he's, he's back in the corner, and, and the pastor starts his sermon. He, he starts his sermon. He, he says, I have a God that will forgive every sin that you've ever done. And, 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 and Cousins, he got up in the back. He says, ha, ha, ha. He says, he says, you have a God that would forgive every sin that I've ever done? And, and Chaplin says, yes. He says, I have a God that would forgive every sin you've ever done, cousins. And he laughed out loud and he sat down. And then he started thinking about that guy that was out in the yard. He started thinking about what's going on here. What's going on? And he started thinking. And he's, in the middle of the sermon, he stood up. He says, he says, you really have a God that would forgive every sin that I've ever done? And he was even starting to weep out of his eyes. And the chaplain says, not only do I have a God that would forgive every sin you've ever done, he says, but I got a God that will forgive every sin you're going to do in the future. <laughs> yes. And, and, and doggone it, he's, he stood there and cried for a little while. And toward the end of the sermon, he stood up. He said, chap, he said, chap, he says, if you got a God that would forgive my sins, I want to know that God. Mm -hmm. And so he did. Can you feel the power of the Holy Spirit yeah. in here? Yeah. Isn't that lovely? It's yeah. wonderful. Okay, now he came up and he gave his life to the Lord. And, and, and that was really an exciting thing. But now uh, I want to tell you about a, a gal that was in this church four, four years ago. And we were sitting right up here in this corner with the, uh, the um, other church. Uh, Crossfire. Uh, Dennis and Debbie McPherson. Yes. Yep. Yeah, Crossfire. Yep. And, and, and now I should know that because I'm an elder there. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the fist? <laughs> yeah, I, I remind myself of somebody He's I know He's been hanging here. out with Pastor David, obviously. 
Oh, isn't it lovely that yeah. God has a humor too? <laughs> yes. Okay, well, uh, we, we came and to a, a prayer meeting and a healing one night. And uh, one of your uh, people here, I know that the Holy Spirit is here. I know that people here have the Holy Spirit. Because we were sitting over here and a lady come up to me and said, I have a word of knowledge for you. I said, really? I said, what is it? She says, well, she said, I don't know what you do, but, but uh, your uh, challenges are going to go greatly up this year. And we were coming home for the summer, right? And then I go back down to Arizona and, and then start all over in the fall. I'm a snowbird. Anyway, I, I thought, wasn't that wonderful? Well, we got down there that fall, and uh, the chaplain came up to me and said, Bob and Tom, he says, he says, I want you guys to start giving them their messages. All of the prisons. He said, I love the way you guys talk. He said, I love what you do. I love how they react when you guys are up in front. And I said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We, we want to do that. Well, I tried to do it for three weeks. I worked hard. My wife and I went over my sermon, over my sermon for three weeks solid. And, and I really worked hard at it. And I said, yes, I'll show you, Lord, that I can do this. Well, doggone it. It never worked. So I, I was at the fourth meeting, and I said, Lord, I says, Lord, what's going on? He says, Bob, he says, he says, I, I know you really worked hard at this, but he says, you can't do it like I can. So I, I said, what, you don't want me to prepare? He says, no. He says, let me give you the words. And so I did. And, you know, after that, every message was was uh, received very well. I had many men coming up and saying, you know, he says, I needed to hear that today. I was thinking about suicide. I haven't heard from my family for two years, and I was really concerned about some things, and, and you calmed my heart down. You see, when you let God speak through you, and not, not only is he going to call you to step out of your comfort zone, and, and when you do, he'll put the words in your heart. Yeah. He'll help you through all of this. Yeah. Well, he did. Yeah. And let me tell you, four years later now, uh, I, I've got a chaplain's clerk. And guess who that is? Cousins. <laughs> yeah. The first man. Yes. He's, he's my chaplain's clerk. That's... And I want you to know, isn't that wonderful? I want you to know that this, that this man... Has, I've never seen a man more focused and more called and more comfortable where he's at. I've seen many people locked up tighter right in churches out here wow. than he is inside that prison. Wow. And I want you to know he'll never take a breath of fresh, free air. He'll be in prison until he passes away. But he has got a focus, and, and he's got goals. And, and all he did was step out of his comfort zone. He didn't have to go very far. Yeah. He just stepped out of his comfort zone, and now he's a kingdom-minded man. Amen. Amen. Kingdom-minded man. Amen. It's a great story. Thank you. Well, we're out of time, but thank you so much for thank sharing. You. Would you guys give it up for Bob? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good job, Bob. God bless you, my friend. Thank you very much.